Well, hello everyone and welcome to our very first Ozark Writers Workshop live panel, Beginning the Writing Journey. This workshop is brought to you by Ozark Book Authority, a local nonprofit organization with the mission to improve literacy in Northwest Arkansas through fundraising, outreach, and regular literary programming. Um, we have three authors with us here today, and I'd like to let them introduce themselves. Uh, Jacqueline, why don't you start? Okay, um, I'm Jacqueline. I go by Jack. Um, a lot of people call me Jack. <laughs> I have written one book that's a young adult fantasy called Rabbit Trap, and it's about, um, it features a lot of Native American mythology. Um, I've also been published in a very new publication that's mostly local, uh, Persephone, that's done by L Media. We find them on Facebook. And I also creative writing at the Future School of Fort Smith. So I kind of have my fingers in a lot of pots, but I'm also, I'm kind of also beginning my writing journey <laughs> to, um, so, but yeah, that's me. Peter, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm Peter Biotish. I'm working on book 19 right now. I'm primarily a nonfiction writer. Uh, my first two books are on business networking. Book number 15 is a book uh, I wrote your first book. It's a book on how to write a book, the basics of writing, publishing, and marketing books. I do seminars on that. I also have an illustrated children's book out there, and I'm working on a fiction book too. But my real lane is nonfiction books. I'm also president of Total Publishing and Media. We're a book publishing company with authors around the world. Um, in a certain aspect, we are kind of an author development company because I do a lot of work with the authors, it's doing the author to author discussion. Uh, regardless of genre, we publish every genre by pornography. So, but regardless of genre, I always have those discussions with the authors to really find out what their passions and areas of expertise are, just to make sure that they are writing in the appropriate line for what they really want to do. So. All right, JC. Uh, my name is JC Crumpton, and my first book that came out was Silence in the Garden. It is a paranormal historical fiction about the Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs. I write. Um, a lot of different stuff. I've written westerns. I've written science fiction, fantasy, and horror as well. Um, I've been. I'm with two different publishers, and I have several different stories and anthologies that are out with uh, both of them. Very cool. You all at very different levels in your writing careers. <laughs> well, that's exciting. That's good. good so, um, what's that, Peter? Good solid panel. A little bit of everything. Yeah. 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 So um, we'll start with, uh, well, the beginning. Uh, when did you first decide you wanted to be a writer? And let's start with Jack. <laughs> um, when I was seven, <laughs> I think I decided that was what I wanted to do. Um, and I held on to that for a long time. You know, a lot of kids will like, they'll have a different career path every day or every week. I held on to that for years. And then when I got to be, I don't know, like my early teens, I guess I decided that that wasn't a realistic dream that you had to make money and that was work. I did that with writing books. And so I kind of floundered around trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, but long story short, I got um, a couple of years ago, I had this little baby and I was staying at home. I knew that she was going to go to school and I wanted a career where I could still take her to school every day and pick her up if I wanted to. And I had all these stories stuffed on computer files or in notebooks. And my husband was like, maybe you should write something. <laughs> and um, here I am. It took me a year to get my first book out. Um, that was right in that time. And there's a lot of people, but that's the only time they have to write. I'm one of them. Um, so if that's you, you can do it. You can totally write a book during that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think a, a lot of um, parents end up, end up writing during those in-between times when they're not having to do parenting. I know I do, so. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But you can do it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You can definitely squeeze it out in any little 30-second blips that you can find. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> All right, uh, Peter, how, uh, when did you first decide you wanted to be a writer? Well, unlike Jack, I never wanted to be a writer. That I'm a writer is kind of shows how big of a sense of humor Jack has. Um, 
I was in the business community teaching business networking and networking groups and businesses and doing lots of speaking. And people would say, hey, great information, where's your book? Well, I, was, I went to a private Catholic school in Massachusetts and when they taught us to write, everyone was supposed to write right-handed. I do everything left-handed. So my penmanship is horrible, worse than doctors. So the well-meaning adults in my life, rather than saying you have bad penmanship, always said, oh man, you can't write, you can't write. So, so I grew into adulthood, I had this up here, I can't write because I was told that like a gazillion times. So when people say, where's your book? I'd say, I can't write, take good notes. Um, <laughs> so eventually, uh, yeah, you're laughing, but that's really my life. Uh, eventually I was like, okay, I do need to get the book out for these seminars I'm doing. It took me 14 years. Uh, basically 13 years and 11 months into it, one of my mentors said, look, you can't write. Go into your computer and pretend you're giving you a three hour seminar. And the words that come out of your mouth, type them out. The book was done three weeks later. And I remember saying, thank you, Jesus. I never have to type again. Yay, I'm done with this. I'm at my book signing. No, the next Tuesday, I'm in a meeting. This guy walks up to me and says, hey, I know you're working on a book on business networking. I've been a concept too. What do you think? And I'm like, brilliant. He goes, great. Let's tell author. Um, with the book signing for book number two, and the former National Teacher of the Year walks up and says, hey, I have an idea for a book. So a lot of the books, some, some of the early books I wrote were uh, – co-authoring situations where people had great ideas, but they were like, hey, you know what you're doing, when I really didn't. Um, and then eventually, um, when book 10 was coming out is when I got total publishing, and just, I enjoy writing now, but there was a time that being a writer, that's why I like when I go to high school reunions, they're they're fascinated at me because in my senior year in high school, I get an F on my term paper, okay? They're like, you're writing, it's really good, you're helping people write, what happened? <laughs> I grew up, I guess. Wow, that's that's actually pretty hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> true, it is true. <laughs> so, JC, what about you? Um, I was probably about five. My uh, mother said the first story that I wrote that was not assigned, well, actually, I wrote when I was five um, in, in first grade, was called The Peanut with Measles. And I've always known that I was going to be a dark writer because the uh, peanut didn't make it. <laughs> and uh and so that that really kind of scared my parents being you know a five-year-old writing about death you know so that that caused them some concern so you know i don't i don't have a problem writing any horror story it's uh it's like oh yeah we'll just do this again <laughs> um but uh um unlike unlike peter when i did my senior term paper uh in the in my second semester of my senior year i was sitting on an f and our term paper was 75% of our grade. So I started it the day it was due. And I did it on George Orwell's 1984. And I ended up with a 99.5%. Nice. So I got a B for the, for the semester. And then when I, I, was, I went into the Navy, and then I got run over by an 18-wheeler, so they kind of kicked me out and said, you know, your brain damage, we don't want you anymore. So the brain damage actually, I think, helps me with my stories because, you know, I can go off on really intricate storylines that just are fascinating to me and myself. But uh, I went to start at the, at the University of Arkansas and declared English with a creative writing emphasis. And uh, 19 years later, when I finally finished, I still had an English with a creative writing emphasis. So, um, I have always wanted to be a writer, and I've never thought of being anything else. Well, that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, also, I want to tell our viewers, if you have any questions, uh, there is a live chat feature on YouTube where you can type in any questions that you have, and we'll get to them uh, after our moderator questions. So our next question is, uh, when you first started writing, like, seriously, like with the goal of publishing or just you really wanted to write a novel, what was the hardest part about that, about getting started and how did you get past it? Uh, let's start with Peter this time. Okay, my degree is in psychology. And I know one side of the brain is the logic side, the other side is the, uh, the creative side. And I made the mistake a lot of first time writers make is you write something you try to fix it, write it, fix it, write it, fix it, write it, fix it. And then eventually you get to paragraph two. <laughs> you know, it, it takes forever to do it like that. And that's part of my problem during those 13 years and 11 months 
is I'd write, fix, write, fix, write, fix. Uh, and I eventually figured out when you're in creative mode, write that first draft. All first drafts are not good, but that's okay. At least you got it. Then you can get into logic mode and start fixing some stuff. Uh, and then, of course, the editors do their things. They're the ones that have the degrees and, you know, and grammar and rhetoric and stuff. Also, to take the pressure off, to me, and what I teach is there's a difference between being a writer and being an author. To me, authors are idea people. I have editors that make me look like they're a writer. So write what's coming out. Don't try to be perfect because there's no such thing as perfection. But when you're in a creative mode, just go down that lane to get the first draft done. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, I also write, and uh, one of the biggest pitfalls I always run into is that perfectionism and not getting that first draft done. So that's really good advice. Uh, JC, what about you? What was the most difficult part about starting writing? Keeping the butt in the chair. That's, I mean, that's the simplest way to put it. Um, actually forcing yourself to sit down, because I mean, I've always got ideas. I've always, I'm always writing on different pieces of paper and notebooks. I have, you know, 100 notebooks around here just filled with ideas, just, they, they just flow, but actually sitting down and organizing all those different notes into, into one cohesive piece and keeping that butt in the chair while you're doing that. Cause I mean, even when I'm sitting here, I'm like sitting there going, Oh, and I can, I can add this to this story over here. Or I mean, maybe I can add a, 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 a sequel to this book, you know, I mean, and all those ideas are flowing. So that's probably the most difficult part is keeping that butt in the chair and keeping your hands on the, on the keyboard or with the pen in your hand. Cause I do a lot of my rough drafts, um, freehand. So long hand. So how do you force yourself to, put your butt in the chair and write music actually um, I, I, I try to listen to um, music that I like I like German and Belgian uh, techno actually um, because I can't understand the words but it's got you know it's, it's really high energy and so it's like I'm in a whole different world when I write it and I'm not trying to, to sing the lyrics because I don't speak German very well, or at all, actually. I can say, was ist das in Deutsch? And that's about it. You know, what is that in German? <laughs> and if you told me, I'd be like, yeah, sure, thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jack, what about you? Um, my hardest thing kind of dovetails with what the guys were saying, but um, it's just finishing. Because um, you can get caught at it up or you can get caught up in like you're kind of in love with your idea but you're not in love with sitting down and typing it out on a computer <laughs> um and so just like muscling through all the you have this little kid inside of you that's like i don't want to do it i don't want to do it you know <laughs> and kind of muscling through that and actually finishing the thing sticking with one idea long enough to get your however many thousands of words on a page. Um, my goal was 75,000 words. Um, that's about how long the first Harry Potter book is. <laughs> and, and my first book is like 74,000, a few hundred words. Um, and that was most editing. So, yeah, I think that's the hardest part to just actually long enough to finish. Can I say something about finishing real quick? Yeah. Um, Stephen Covey, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. The first habit is begin with the end in mind. And so, what a lot of times with my books or articles, I write lots of articles too, is you know the book or the article, whatever you're writing, is a letter to who you're writing it to. So one thing I always tell or ask authors is when someone gets done with your book, they, they get to the end, they put the book down, how do you want them to feel? So if you start thinking about how you want them to feel and even maybe even write out the last sentence or two, you, if you got that ending, you know where you're going to, then you still you still have to take the journey, but at least you kind of know where you're going to. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that because, like, it was more, um, I guess, they kind of metaphorical. I had this one that I needed to get on. So I wouldn't let myself write anything until I got everything else done. <laughs> like, that that was the last that I wrote the, the whole book. Um and someone gave me the advice once that when you have 
a story that you're writing, you shouldn't tell people about it. Um, and that really worked for me because part of um, the drive right out there is you're having great friends, your husband, or you know whatever. Then some of that drive and is gone already, um, and so that helped me a lot. And it was like a huge secret. I'm not a good secret keeper. Part of why I got out of social work the worst secret keep not tell me the secret <laughs> and so for me to hold on to the story like for a year it was killer but i was way more money way through that time to write it because of that <laughs> okay um so uh, Jack, just to follow up on that, um, so how is it that you kind of, I guess, inspire yourself to do the finishing and get past that that block that you have? Well, I think you have to um, kind of commit to it is a big part of it for me. I had to commit to, to this idea that it was not just going to be a hobby that I let to the side. Um, because lots of people have lots of hobby projects that they do. Um, and I think there's a lot of people that are like, I have this great book idea, but they never actually write it because it's not important to them. Right? Not important to them. Um, so you kind of have to commit to the idea that you're going to and you have to approach your writing kind of like a job. Like, um, if you have like a shift job and you go in and you don't want to do the work, you still do it because otherwise you can lose your job um when you are writing that first book it's really like you have to think of it like i put in hours is how i thought of it um and i got uh um i got really focused on word count and you can get too focused on those things but for me that made me feel like i had put in my hours for the week as a writer if i hit a certain word count goal um because when you're doing it on the side like that it's also a work life balance that you have to figure out but that helped me stay focused um through it all and it took some of the emotion out of it too like when you know you have work at eight o'clock the next morning and you don't feel like going to work, most of the time you still go to work, whether you feel like it or not. <laughs> um, but when you're just writing for yourself, there's no one, there's no repercussions. There's no one that's going to, you know, make you go and sit at your computer and write um, or who's going to ask you, like, where are your pages for this week or whatever. Um, and so I had to kind of hold myself to that week. That's what worked for me. You look like you just dropped off the page. <laughs> yeah, I did. I dropped my phone. Like, <laughs> whoa. Yeah. The, the stand I'm using, I accidentally kicked it. And <laughs> Sorry, guys. I was waiting for a crash. Yeah. yeah, to kind of piggyback off of that, um, studies have shown that 90% uh, of the people have ideas for books, but only 2% do something with it. So knowing that just by getting that 2%, that's quite an accomplishment. And uh, the 88% the, is the still out there. So if, if you actually have started writing a book, that actually gets you ahead of the crowd. If you actually finish the book, that really gets you ahead of the crowd, but it gives you some statistical perspective on the whole thing. So we have a question from uh, one of our viewers that will do a quick aside too. Um, I want to know, do you always have a complete story in mind when you begin? And uh, JC, if you want to start. Um, typically, yes. Um, as Peter was saying earlier, um, start with the, with the end in mind. And I usually know exactly where the story is going to end. I know um, to Peter's point, um, how I want the readers to feel. And it's usually, um, usually sad or angry that I want them to feel. I want them to feel personally invested and involved that they are upset that this happened or this didn't happen. Um, I like people to be emotionally involved in, in my stories. But yes, I start with the within in mind. I, and a lot of times it's, 
I will, my ideas are like, well, that'd be a great ending. Um, and then you just start from there and you say, why did he get to this situation? Or why did she do this that, that, that made this the ending? And that's where you build the story. Jack, what about you? Not, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally not. Um, I am uh, what I like to call it a discovery rider, or you know, it's a, a lot of people call it a pantser. Like you, you just sit down and ride, and you don't have a like a plot or a line. Um, and I'm under that. I even have tried to outline, and it actually makes my writing a lot worse. Um, so I just don't worry about it anymore. But I, what usually starts for me, I'm very character driven um, personally, and in my writing. Um, and so I usually have a particular character in mind that I start with, and I often, when I start writing, have a climax point, but everything else I kind of discover for myself along the way as I write, but that means I have a lot more editing to do, <laughs> so, so um, and I'm okay with that, but there's all kinds of writers out there, everybody's a little bit different, I think, um. But yeah, I definitely do not have the whole story. I don't have a lot figured out when I start. <laughs> so, Peter, you primarily write nonfiction. Do you write any fiction? Yeah, I write some fiction. Uh, yeah. Okay. And really, my process is kind of a hybrid between both of what was just presented because on one hand, I, 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 I know where I, I see the whole thing in my head to a certain extent, you know, that's like specifically vague, uh, regardless of what genre I'm writing. Uh, when I start writing and, and the concepts become real, sometimes it will actually come out in, in several different um, manuscripts or Word documents. And by what I end up doing sometimes is take the best of each one to combine them into one document. Um, I used to write a lot of music, and some of the best music I ever written was really I pick a piece from this piece I wrote, the piece from that piece I wrote, the piece from that piece I wrote, put them together, and boom, there's something good. And sometimes my, my book writing is the same way. Well, I'll, I've written one scene or one concept or one thought in one document and in something totally unrelated, I'll write something else and I'll go, wow, maybe those two go together. Um, there's, there's something I wrote a couple of weeks ago that was a compilation of four different documents. In the end, became one document. When I sent it to my editor, they were like, hey, this is just what we were looking for. So, so it's kind of a hybrid of those two things. I just love how you guys are all so different. <laughs> I'll have different answers for everything. It's great. Um, so uh, for a fun question, uh, how many unpublished or half finished manuscripts do you have? <laughs> uh, Peter, why don't we start with you? With who? With you. Me? Oh, gee. Um, on the book side, I think it's at 54, and on the article side, probably around 40. Like unfinished or finished? Unfinished. Un oh my god. Unfinished, yeah. Yeah, you know, like I said, I'm working on book 19, and I've got written hundreds of articles and short stories. I definitely short stories, I write a lot of short stories too. But as far as unfinished projects that are just sitting there in the burner, when I pull up my Word documents, it's probably about, you know, you know 100, 120 combined. But again, I view that also as a library of ideas that I can pull from for other projects too. And then um, by the time I go to bed tonight, I'll probably have added some more to that. So still, still trying to work on that peanut that didn't survive, the measles thing. And yeah, you know, we may come up with something on that. That's really impressive though. That's, I think you win something. <laughs> Unfinished stuff, or just have lots of ideas that are useless. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the other thing too. You know what's useless right now? I mean, there's there's some stuff I'm working on on book 19 that I'm pulling from stuff I wrote 10 years ago because it was not for the right thing at the right time. So when you have the creative idea, yeah. file it. Don't don't you know? Don't make it go away. That recycle bin. File it because you never know. Um, I'm very, very organized. So if I know if I'm doing something on a certain topic or a certain scene or a certain type of character or a certain feeling, I can go into my my library in, in Word and find something. It was like, oh, okay, we started that, we didn't finish it. And once every six months or so, I'll go through my all my documents just to see what's there. 
you know, find stuff I forget all about. It's like a new discovery. It's like Christmas twice a year. Because <laughs> we're all creative people. And if, if you, you, you think of something now, you write it down real quickly, uh, either by hand or by in, in Word document, um, it's gone the next morning. But, but it's memorialized somewhere. Yep. I think that's really interesting. Um, just as a quick anecdote, I guess, for me, is I stopped writing things down for that reason <laughs> because I had, like, hundreds and hundreds of ideas that I had no idea what to do with. Um, so I just let them disappear. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But see, writing is a craft. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Yep. So the, the the me I am now, hopefully 10 years from now, I'll be a better me. And that idea that I thought was really stupid may be brilliant or it may still be stupid. You don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, Jacqueline, what about you? How many unpublished or half finished manuscripts do you have? I mean, I don't I don't have any that are finished but unpublished, but I have just gobs and gobs of unfinished stories, short things like that um i i'm not even sure i can put a number on it um but like i've been writing for so long and i still have most of the things i wrote from like high school and stuff just because um i kind of discovered that my parents have been keeping all of those notebooks <laughs> and so yeah. let me tell you the embarrassing uh exercise is to go through all of those and read them and some of them are so bad. <laughs> like they're, they're really bad. Um, but it did show me that um, even at like an, a pretty early age, I was kind of naturally working through some pretty good writing exercises without realizing it. Like when I was younger, especially, I would watch a movie and then I would rewrite a scene with like slightly different characters or a different take on it. And that helped me a lot with learning how, like, timing of things or pacing, whatever you want to call it. Um, it helped me a lot with figuring out what I liked about characters, what I didn't like about characters. Um, so, yeah, I don't know what age group we have in terms of viewers, but if you're younger, um, if you can convince somebody to keep those notebooks for you, do it. And 10 or 15 years from now, look through them and you'll get a laugh, but you might find some little hidden gems. I actually have one story that I've been progressively working on since I was probably 15 and I'll work on it a little bit and then shelve it because at some point I realized what I was trying to write my characters through I actually had not experienced enough of life to write it myself <laughs> and so I'm still kind of waiting to like arrive enough as a writer that I feel like I can do this story justice. Um, and I think a lot of writers kind of have little pet projects like that. Um, but I definitely have one. I have loads of little short stories that, I, that I've never finished. And a lot of them I probably never will. But every now and then I find something and I go, hey, this was actually, this was actually okay. I should do something with this. Mm -hmm. um, and as I get a little bit better every year, there's more of them that I can take them and do something with them. So you build on your skills and, you know, just because something was terrible the first time you wrote it, that doesn't mean you can't take it and kind of fix it up and change it and make it into something good. So anyways. <laughs> no, that's a really good point. Um, I, I, I like to refer to it as cannibalizing yeah. old stories. <laughs> Yeah. Take parts of old stories and fit them into the new ones. Yeah. So, uh, JC, what about you? How many unpublished or half-finished works do you have? Um, I have approximately, tw yeah, I told you I like to write everything down and lots of ideas. And I have approximately 22 books that I have notebooks on. And I have extensive notes on a lot of them. So, I have basically, I have 22 endings written. Um and that's for, for books. Um, I have mentioned earlier, I guess, before our, our conversation when we were talking, um, I have two nonfiction books that are mostly done, but I've never really wanted them to, to see the light of day because everybody would hate me then. Um, Peter said that's a good thing, though. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, it's all about the marketing. <laughs> that's the marketing, yeah. Um, and then I've got a lot of short stories. Um, I don't know. I can't even tell you exactly how many. 
um, short stories, but talking about writing things down in notebooks and stuff. Um, about a year ago, I was going through um, an old box that had a lot of my stuff from when I was in the Navy. And when you're in, in boot camp, you're training, you have these little notebooks that you fold in half and you keep in your back pocket. And they were supposed to be for notes during class and stuff, but I had half of each of them were filled with stories. So maybe it's a good thing that I was discharged medically because if it came down to it, maybe I would have forgotten everything that I was being trained to because I was writing stories at the time. So, you know, it's a, uh, that was my destiny. That was my path. You know, I wasn't supposed to be um, where I was. I was supposed to be writing. So that turns out to be uh, a good thing, I guess. Can I, can I jump on that a little bit? Um, so when I was in high school, I also I also like to draw. It's not something I've pursued professionally, but I do like to draw for fun. And I had several textbooks that, like, in the margins and on the little graphic boxes, I had, like, little comic book stories. So whoever got that, those books after me, <laughs> you're welcome. You got all these comic books that have nothing to do with biology, by the way. <laughs> But there they are. But yeah, I also had like lots of notes and margins for books that are not at all what I was supposed to be taking notes on. <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty great. I love. That. Well, that, I'm not unusual. Yeah. 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 Or maybe just writers are a weird group to begin with. I don't know. <laughs> I think that might be it. <laughs> We're all a little bit weird. That yeah. <laughs> I like to think of it as statistically significant. Yeah, <laughs> that works. I'll take well, that. it's funny, you know, you you talking about that, because I remember um, 10th grade English, we'd have to do a journal entry the first, like, five or ten minutes every class. And I got tired of writing about, you know, real life, so I started writing short stories during that time. <laughs> and so, yeah, you're not alone. <laughs> um. So we have a, another uh, viewer question, and um, any of you could uh, answer this one. Um, so I'm an avid reader and all my life, and uh, I fear that I might accidentally plagiarize by thinking of an event or an idea and not realizing that I read it before. So how do each of you avoid accidentally plagiarizing something? And whoever wants to jump in can jump in. <laughs> I'll go first. Um, research. Lots of research um, and also having some really good beta readers and good, good, good people around you reading your stuff that you really trust. Um, one, of the, one of the funny things happened with the book, the, company, the publishing company, years ago this guy pitched me this science fiction book and he's a great science fiction writer, um, was passionate, expert, on and on and on, but when he got done with the story I said, doesn't that sound like Star Wars? And he was like, oh man, you're right. But if you're so so close to it, uh, and that does happen a lot in, in in all the genres, not just you know fiction, but in all the genres that we run across at, here at the company, and it just comes back to: Have you had someone read your work? No. Well, you know, get some people that you really trust, have them read parts, if not all of it, and they'll tell you real quickly. But also do your own research too. Do either of uh, you have something to add to that? Research is the biggest thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I've I've written a story um, and called it one one name, and then I realized that it was very close to the to the name. It wasn't the story wasn't similar, but the the name was something that I had read when I was in high school, and so I'm like going, oh, I got to change the name to that. And then you know, I've written some stuff, and I'm like going, well, you know, that sounds familiar. And so it's it's just like Peter said, you have to have to know your market. You have to know what's out there. Um, and whether it's someone that can help you out with that or whether it's something that you dig up on your own, it's just about looking, just about finding it. Um, and that can be really hard, I imagine. Like the the writer that presented to Peter, working on something that long and, and, and doing it that well just to find out that it's too similar to something else that's already out there. I mean, that's got to be heartbreaking. The look on his face was precious. I, 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 I heard for him, but at the same time, I, I could tell he was up to the challenge too. But yeah, it was interesting. Now, so the thing is too, is that 
anything, here's the good news and the bad news. Any topic you write in any genre, there's already something out there on it. Writing has been around for hundreds of years. The thing is, what do you bring different to that particular yeah. genre, that work, or that, that subgenre? And as I have a list at the office of 3,553 genres and subgenres, so there's a lot of them out there. So, yeah, yeah, do your homework. But there's a reason why there's only 2% that do this. <laughs> Jack, do you have anything to add? I would just say, um, talking to other writers, it's probably uh, less likely to happen that, than you might think in terms of like actual, you're in legal trouble plagiarism. Um, but also, if you think about like a book like or a series like The Lord of the Rings, um, we've all been doing knockoffs of Lord of the Rings pretty much ever since it was written. So <laughs> I think you have to, it's okay to take things from other stories because a lot of times that's what inspires us to get into writing in the first place. But at the same time, like what Peter was saying, you have to find out what do you bring to this story that's new and is that new enough to make it interesting to your market worth pursuing and publishing or whatever. Because I've seen some people do pitches that it was like, my story is this. And they list a super famous title, like Harry Potter or something. And then they're like, except it happens in a city or something. Like, it's not dramatically different, you know? <laughs> um, and, I and like, if you follow Pitch Wars on Twitter, a lot of times those pitches are not generating a lot of interest from literary agents. So you do kind of have to figure out some market stuff. Um, but I would say to anybody who's concerned that they're just going to like wholesale rip off a book that they have read um, unknowingly, probably less likely than you might think. You're probably more worried about it than you should be. <laughs> but yes, you definitely do need to do research um, and let other people read it and kind of give you feedback. But usually that's going to fix the problems for you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the term plot lines. If you study plot lines, um, it's pretty much agreed within the industry there's only really four plot lines. Everything else is a theme of variation on that. Shakespeare was the master of the four plot lines. Mm -hmm. And if you if you think about how many times you've seen Romeo and Juliet in different different forms. I mean, West Side Story is just one of them, but every every there's so many movies you go to. It's like, oh, there's Romeo and Juliet. There's that plot line again. Same plot line, different dressing. Uh, in understanding the theme of variations of the four different plot lines. Uh, it's a part of learning the craft. Yeah. Well, those are all really good points, you guys. Yay. <laughs> Can I add a little bit right there? Um, to, to Jacqueline's point, if you if you have something, make it your own. You know, if it is similar, but just make it your own. And so, and then you can avoid it. I mean, I've seen, I was watching a documentary a couple months ago on um, movies that everybody was like going, oh, well, this is very similar to this. And it's like, um, Quentin Tarantino, uh, I think it was um, uh, Reservoir Dogs, somebody said was a ripoff of some um, old Japanese movie. And so he was. He said it in an interview, he said, no, he said, um, it's a tribute because I really loved what he had done. And so I wanted to, to do it also, but in a different setting. And I mean, he gave it, he gave it credit to what he had borrowed from or what was his guiding, uh, got, what guided him to it. So... Yeah, I think that's, yeah, your own. Yeah, yeah. I think that's an important thing too is, you know, you can lean into your influences and, you know, make it a tribute or, uh, you know, be like, yes, I was inspired by this thing. And it could be a selling point for you. Um, or maybe not. Maybe it's too similar. <laughs> but, you know, you, it's one of those things like make it your own. It's, it's like we've all said, um, if you add your own spin to it, it's immediately different because it's your voice and your story yeah. and so um well that was that was a really good question so uh thanks linda for asking um so uh, back to my pre-written questions <laughs> <laughs> um for uh people who are getting started and kind of don't really know how they're supposed to be writing supposed to be uh, what does your usual writing time look like? When you sit down to write, when do you do it? How do you do it? 
et cetera at all. Uh, JC, why don't you go first? My writing time is, uh, like I said at the beginning, you know, I have to force myself to, to keep that butt in the chair. Um, and so I basically start, and I got this, um, this idea from a friend of mine who is a musician. And he said, and I was, we, I was talking about him, you know, I bought it, one of those uh, learn to play the ukulele things. And I said, but how do I do that? I said, it's, it's just like, it's really difficult at first. And he goes, well, just instead of, you know, I was like, well, I want to set an hour aside to do it. And he goes, no, set, set aside 15 minutes. He said, when you set aside 15 minutes, you'll end up going longer and not even realizing it. And so I was like, well, hey, maybe I need to apply that to my writing. So I sit down for it. I was like, hey, I'm going to run upstairs real quick and write for 15 minutes. And I end up coming back downstairs um, an hour and a half. And the movie's already over. And my wife is like, well, you already missed it. So I'm like, okay, but I got something written. <laughs> Jack, what about you? What does your daily writing life look like? Um, so I I don't write every single day. There's a lot of people that swear by that, but I kind of feel like with a daily goal, I feel sort of like trapped in and I rebel against it. <laughs> but I do have <laughs> weekly goals. Um, and so uh, for me, my goal was to write 5,000 words in a week. And now this was me, a full-time stay-at-home mom. And... Uh, to a small child and so the only time I had to work with was um, she would take a short nap in the afternoon and then after she went to bed I had about an hour that I could work on so sometimes I the max I would get would be like three hours that was a good day for writing um, and I am learning from talking to people that I can write pretty fast like I type pretty fast um, if you're not good at typing you're naturally going to be slower so that's something to think about. I type pretty well, and I tend to write fast. So I can sometimes get as much as 2,000 words in an hour. Now, there's a lot of people that that's very normal. But what I have read is that m the average person is hitting about 500 words an hour. Um, I would That's what I'm told is pretty average. So you should not m like sit down and expect to write 2,000 words in an hour and do that for eight hours straight because you'll be a crazy person, first of all. <laughs> because I was spending all those not hours like cleaning bottles and thinking about my plot or changing diapers and thinking about what is this character going to do next. So when I did finally get that hour or two hours, I could really just pound it out because the story was already in my head. Um, if you have a job that's very mentally demanding that you're at all day and then and you have no time to think about what you're writing and then you come home at night and you have an hour, it's going to naturally be slower for you just because you're having to just start thinking about it as when you sit down for that hour. So I would say it's different for everybody. Um, and you kind of have to find your rhythm. I've seen people that swear by the like 500 words a day thing. Um, that didn't work for me. So I set a weekly goal um, and I had to adjust that a little bit. So my advice for someone starting out would be to decide on a daily word count goal or a weekly word count goal. And just try it for a couple of weeks. And if you get through a couple of weeks and it's not working, adjust it for what works for you. And you'll find a rhythm. Um, that So that's my advice, I guess. <laughs> Peter, what about you? I want to confuse the listening audience. <laughs> <laughs> you did a good job of picking this panel. Well, let's get rid of everything. Okay. Um, I'm originally from the music industry, so I'm a night person. So my natural writing time is at night. Although if inspiration during, hits me during the day, I'll, I'll start writing. I Naturally, I found that I tend to write in 40-minute blocks. It just seems to work well for me. Word count, to me, is irrelevant. I'm about content. It, it doesn't matter what genre I'm, I'm working on. And For the company, people ask me all the time, how big should my book be? I'm like, give me content. You know, We can figure the word thing out. You know, give me content. So while some people set their goals by words, I set it by how much I've accomplished on on the the article, the short story, the the chapter. It's really about did I tell that part of the story that I wanted to tell and tell it well. Um, doesn't matter if it took five words or you know, fifty thousand words. Um, so it's really about that content. And it's really kind of funny too because a lot of times I'll, I'll write a complete piece or a complete chapter or a complete something, 
and never look at the word count at all. I'm strictly looking at the content. So there's, there's different ways of gauging it. Um, the, my philosophy is because as a reader, I don't count words as a reader. I'm counting, I'm reading content. I'm reading feeling, I'm reading scenes, I'm reading emotion, I'm reading that. I'm not, I don't care what the word count is when I get to buy a book or, or read an article or whatever else. So as a writer, I, I feel the same way. Word count's totally irrelevant. Now, if we're working on a project, then it has to be a certain size, which happens every now and then. Okay, word count can be probably important, but I also know from a publishing side, typesetting can, can manipulate size of anything also. You know, I want to book this thick, okay? I, you can give me 20,000 words, 5,000 words, or 120,000 words. It'll still be that thick, okay? Trim size and typesetting takes care of all that. So people read content. People buy content. So as a writer, I'm very content-driven, which is completely opposite from what you all said, but that's why we're here. <laughs> yeah, I would um, be back on that and say that your content is definitely always going to be most important for me word count was a good metric to help me stay at a pace um, but my I would say the biggest advice I would say to to not do is to not go okay I'm gonna write for an hour every day and then you sit down and half of that hour you're like staring off into space thinking about your grocery list you're not actually writing <laughs> Yeah. So I would say don't do that. <laughs> but yeah, I find what like whatever works for you. I think you just have to test it out until you find what works really. Yeah. Yeah, because I did the word count thing way back when, and that's what tripped me up. <laughs> yeah. My neighbor said, think about content, I'm, boom, I'm off to the races. Mm -hmm. So yeah, different things for different people. Yeah. Well, when I started with the newspaper, it was all about inches. Yeah. Yep. So, but I mean, and, and I do do a certain time, but I, like I said, I sit down and say, I'm going to write for 15 minutes, you know, and then that becomes longer usually. So I don't try to set a specific time where I'm going to work because just like Jack said, I mean, I would be staring off in space and thinking about the 22 books that I haven't finished yet. <laughs> and it's like, well, this would be a good idea to add to that. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and just as an aside, for filing purposes, on my computer, I've had a, a, a file for years. It's called Peter B. Otish Books in Progress. And that's why I was able to give a number so quickly. Um, if you have a file like that on your computer just for organizational purposes, it'll help you out. So we have a follow-up question. Um, so you're basically saying there's no one best way. You just find the way that works for you. I think we might all agree with that. <laughs> yes. yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I found it helpful to track um, what I was doing in the beginning to help me figure out what was working best for me. But you, there, you kind of feel it, too. Or I did. I kind of felt like this feels right now, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> now, there's some trial and error. I, you know, it took me five books to kind of figure this whole thing out. So, yeah, there's, there is a lot of trial and error because there's a lot of information. to soak in. I'll try this. I'll try that. Or try variations. Yeah. Yeah, it's like um, I've been writing professionally with publication in mind for 10 years, and I'm still finding new ways to, to change up the way I write. So it's it's not something you have to, like, pick, and then that's how you write forever. You can always change it up, too. So, so um, we're coming up on an hour, so uh, we got to have one more question. So what one piece of advice would you give new writers just getting started on their journeys? Jack, why don't we start with you? <laughs> Since you made a face. <laughs> um, if I had to do one piece of advice, I would say um, read as much as you can stand. Um, read books about writing. Read on the craft of writing. Read what other people are doing. Um, I try to read like an unknown author once a year, a bestseller once a year. Um, I try to read different genres. Um, so as you are writing in one genre, you should read some other things in that genre, but you should read as much and as broadly as you possibly can um, because you're going to start naturally learning from that. Um, and I think it helps build all of your skills because – like if you write romance, you also need to know how to 
do comedic timing. You also know how to increase the drama in a story. You also need to know about pacing. You also, you know, all these things. You might need to know how to set up a really scary moment, which you're not going to necessarily get only reading romance. So read as widely as you possibly can and as often as you can and always mentally be taking notes like this worked really well how can I use that for my stories so I would say that was my number one piece of advice Peter what do you have for us um don't be overly critical of yourself and enjoy it yeah Yeah. there you go (laughs) worth to live by (laughs) That's a good one, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. JC, what about you? Uh, Don't be afraid to talk to people, other writers, um, but especially readers. Um, ask people, you know, what they like, what what they don't like, but don't be afraid to talk to people. You know, we were talking about before we began how I tend to be more of an introvert and would you know love to go to that mountain cabin far away where it take people seven months just to reach me and. But, you know, you still can't be afraid to talk to people, to find out what they're reading, why they're reading what they're reading. Um, you know, it's like I love, sci- I love science fiction and fantasy. Um, I read it. That's what I tend to read mostly. Um, I try to read Lord of the Rings once a year. But a lot of the younger people, they find Lord of the Rings boring. And so it's like, you know, if I'm putting out a, a fantasy, I can't put out another um, Lord of the Rings because people aren't going to read it. The people who are buying the books today, they need something different. And, and so you, you've got to be talking to people to find out what they're, what they're looking for. And that means in the industry as well. Um, don't be afraid to, if you're up at, a, if you're at a conference, don't be afraid to talk to a publisher or talk to an editor, um, talk to these people. And the only way you're going to build your network um Peter happens to be an expert on network building, right? Um, And the only way you're going to do that is by actually talking to people. Some of the best advice I got starting out was because I went to an author signing at a local bookstore and just hung around awkwardly until the author talked to me. (laughs) 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 And like, so don't be afraid to be a little bit awkward. Like, cause I used to think like, well, I haven't read their book, so I shouldn't go to their signing. No, as someone who now has done some signings, please come ask me whatever you want. (laughs) (laughs) Please come. <laughs> yeah. We've all been through this. <laughs> yep. Great advice. Um, so uh, we have one last question. I think we've got a little bit left time left. Um, what are your thoughts on templated writing such as Save the Cat? If you're not familiar with that, it's like the 15 point beat sheet. Um, then there's other things like the hero's journey, those kinds of things. What are your thoughts on that, uh, Peter? Um, I guess my, my process is very different than that. So I'm probably not a real good one to answer that question because I'm really more of a, a, a um, free float type of person. JC, what about you? Um, I don't know what that is. <laughs> I'll take it if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I write what what comes to me. Um, I don't f- try to follow a template or anything. Um, just like we said at the beginning, um, start with the ending in mind is what I do. And then I, I just let it organically explode from there. All right, Jack, what about you? Okay, so I can totally take this question. (laughs) Um, I have not used uh, Save the Cat personally, but I've used some other ones. Um, So I would say for me, because I am a discovery writer who has no plot in the beginning, what I find um, and am finding is that I get about 20,000 words into my story and kind of get lost in it a little bit. Um, and end up having to do like some heavy editing to get kind of back on course um, because I tend to be very backstory heavy and I kind of go, okay, this my story is now just the backstory and I have to figure out where to pair back. And I do use um, a variation of the hero's journey, which 
a nine point plot dot to kind of help me get back in line with what I'm trying to do with my story. Um, and there's other ones out there. Um, and then I also sometimes use, if I feel like a character is not coming alive, I use some of the character questionnaires that are out there. I like the Marcel Proust questionnaire. It's like 35 questions long. Um, so I, my opinion is if you're somebody very heavy on plotting before you ever write, they can be good to help you kind of navigate um, your first couple of stories until you kind of get uh, into a, your own rhythm. And if you're like me and you are a pantser or a discovery writer or whatever you want to call it, and you find that you're getting lost in your own story and you don't even know like where to go next or how to edit what you have, I would say that they can be helpful to help kind of zero in on what it is you're trying to do. So that's the two situations I would think where they would be really especially for a beginning writer and my hope is that I'll get to a point where I have enough of my own rhythm that I don't need it as much um, but I, I see a lot of beginner writers use those to kind of help navigate those particular situations. <laughs> now, to piggyback off of that uh, one, one uh, statistic within the industry that I think is kind of interesting is that most books do not get read beyond page 18. So as people are developing their plots and their characters and everything else, it's it's important to make sure that you've you've hooked that reader in in the first you know 10, 15 pages or so. We get a lot of manuscripts where someone says, "Well, I'm trying to build up to something really big," and I'm like, "It doesn't matter if the reader never gets to it." Yeah. But knowing that before that that's 18 pages typeset, so you know manuscript pages, you know I go 10 to 12 pages into it, maybe 15 at the most. Uh, to make sure that that reader is invested in whatever you want them to be invested in and then then you've got them to build up to what you want to build up to yeah i i do uh for young adults and i i would venture to say it's probably even less for young adults if i had to just guess um and i would also say for me personally the most editing i do from start to finish is always in the first couple of pages the first chapter mm -hmm they need to be so impact heavy to draw people in um so yeah that i, I agree with what he's saying <laughs> yeah can i well because this this is what writing and basics of writing i'm gonna throw a quick grammar thing out there just for the fun of it um if you when when you get your manuscript done and then make it as good as you can make it do an and run and a that run the word a and d if there's more than one end in a sentence it's two sentences unless it's dialogue but the word that this is the most important one the word that in writing is nothing more than a filler word. The rule or the law of that is 90% of the time you can take the word that out of a manuscript, out of a sentence, replace it with nothing, it just tightens it up. 3% uh, of the time, replace it with the word which, W-H-I-C-H, -H, uh, and those are 7% of the time, and then 3% of the time, leave the word that in there. Um, that's, that is something that's important, especially for rookie writers. And uh, I was doing one of my seminars down in Houston on this, and on the way back to the airport, an author in the audience who was a very accomplished author uh, texted me. She had run home and just pulled 300 dats out of her current manuscript. And, and I hear that happening a lot where people run home and pull out hundreds of dats. So be cautious of that one word. There are some editors that when they get a manuscript, they will automatically delete the, all the dats from the manuscript using a word tool and then, then then start editing. So just be aware of that. I have an editor who that she hates the word that. And that's mm -hmm. the first thing she does is she looks for that. And if she sees a bunch of that, she just hands it right back to you. Doesn't even want to look at it. Yeah, when we get manuscripts, I'm a speed reader. So I usually open up in the middle of the document and I'm speed reading, but I'm counting that. If it takes me, you know, three paragraphs to get to a that, I know what I got. If I see six that's in the first three sentences, I know, I know what I got. <laughs> have yeah yeah had and have are are my words that i have to watch out for i overuse those and i end up editing out a lot of had and have like in terms of um past tense like have done had you know had done whatever um that that's one that i edit out a lot and then i see a lot of people waving the flag of no adverbs <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't know what I'm talking about. Read uh, Stephen King's On Writing. He's one of them. I read another book. Um, oh, shoot. Um, Self Revision for Writers by Rennie Brown. That's another really good one. They talk about that. Those are really good books on it. Um, but yeah, adverbs. And if 
especially uh, dialogue tags are a big deal too. In mm -hmm. So watch all of those. Don't put a tag on there if you don't absolutely need it. Like I actually have beta readers every now and then tell me, I don't know who's talking here. And that tells me, oh, I've finally taken out enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Once again. <laughs> yeah, the other thing too, when you get your manuscript the way you want it, read it out loud. Because if there's a passage that you're stumbling over when you're reading out loud, that's a passage or that needs to be worked on. Yeah, I'm actually doing that right now. It does help, and it's exhausting, but it's worth yeah. it. <laughs> it's exhausting, yes. <laughs> well, we're a little bit over an hour, so I think we're going to wrap up now. Um, but uh, I want to thank everyone, uh, our lovely panelists, for joining us and sharing their experiences uh, with writing. And uh, thank our viewers for joining us for our very first uh, panel for Ozark Writers Workshop 2020. Um, and uh, before we go, uh, is there anything each of you would want to promote, like your latest book that's out and uh, where can viewers find you online? Uh, Jack, why don't you start? Okay, I have a website. It's just JacquelineHolmesBooks.com. Um, this is the book I have out, Rabbit Trapped. Um, the second one is coming out pretty soon. I don't have an official release date yet, but I'm hoping for early August. And then I also like to tell people about this literary magazine. It's just getting started. So if you have a short story and you're looking to submit it somewhere, like you feel like you have a pretty good one, there's not as much competition for this particular magazine yet because it's still pretty new, but it's called Persephone. And you can find out about it through Zelda Media, which is on Facebook. And they also have a website that's writersofzelda.com. But yeah, you can find me on my website, JacquelineHolmesBooks.com. All right, Peter, where can people find you? Uh, Total Publishing and Media is the website. And then for purposes of what we're doing here, uh, write your first book. Um, by Peter B. Yadish, available at Amazon.com or wherever you like to buy your books. Uh, the first third talks about the writing process, different genres. Uh, the, the middle part talks about publishing, and the last part talks about marketing. So it's, it's a, in one short volume, you get the, a lot of meat, and then you can contact me. Anyone that buys the book, I will always spend time uh, counseling with or, or working with, uh, because if they would make the small investment themselves, I'll, I'll gladly help you out. <laughs> All right, JC, what do you got? You're muted. <laughs> I just realized it just popped up. Sorry, um, and it was. I'm just trying to mime here and practicing. Um, no, it's uh, jc-crumpton.com is my website. Um, I have two books out right now: um, Silence in the Garden, which is about the Crescent Hotel in, Eure in Eureka Springs, and Cardboard Heroes is a collection of short stories and poems as well, both um, unpublished or new and previously published as well. Um, I'm also, I have an also, uh, have a Facebook page, uh, JC Crumpton, um, forward slash author. Okay. Well, thanks again, everyone for joining us. And, uh, once again, this workshop was produced by Ozark Book Authority, a local nonprofit with the mission to improve literacy in Northwest Arkansas. You can donate at any time at www.ozarkbookauthority.com forward slash donate to help fund more events like this one. Uh, our next panel is going to be Monday, uh, July 13th at 6 p.m. for writing tips and tricks. So thank you all for coming and uh, I hope you guys had fun. <laughs> thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us. This was great. Yeah, it was really a lot of fun. <laughs> all right, well, thanks you guys. Okay.